Hi, I'm Jonathan, and I'm going to teach you algebra as fast as I can, so let's go. Okay, we're going to start with pre-algebra, now adding fractions, 3 sevenths plus 2 sevenths. What does that equal? Well, it has the same denominator, 7 and 7, so you add the numerator, 3 plus 2 is 5 over 7. You carry that over, so that's how you add. Now, um, now you have these... Multiplication problems, 3 fourths times 3 fourths. What do you do? You just go across numerator times numerator, denominator times denominator. That's 9 sixteenths. Now, adding 0 0.5 plus 0 0.35 plus 1.5. 0 0.5 plus 0 0.35. Do that in your head. 0 0.85 plus 1.5. Also do that in your head. That's 2.35. Okay. So, now... You know how to do long division, right? Well, just in case you forgot, 52, 8. How many times does 8 fit, fit into 52? Well, it fits in 6 times, so 8 times 6 is 48. That's 2, that's 4. So we have 4, 8 fits into 4, 0 0.5 times, so 0 0.5, 8, 52, divided by 8, equals 6.5 and then we could check that with a calculator so 58 divided by 52 52 divided by 8 is 6.5 okay good so let's continue to algebra now variables what are variables well variables are basically symbols that mean something else so if I have n that can mean 7. So I'm basically saying n equals 7. So any time you see n in this particular problem, I actually mean 7. So if n equals 7, what is n plus n plus 8? So you say, okay, 7 plus 7 plus 8. So that's 14 plus 8, and that's 22. So basically, you also could represent n plus n as 2n. So x plus x, what does that equal? Well, that equals 2x, because there's two x's. Now, what is x plus x plus 2x? Well, x plus x is 2x. 2x plus 2x is 4x. Now, what's x times x? That is x squared. If you've never seen this before, that's an exponent. That means that you multiplied something by itself and that gives you x squared. If it's x times x times x, it's x to the third because you're multiplying three x's together. Now we'll come back to that later. Now let's talk about order of operations. Remember this, my dear Aunt Sally. My stands for multiplication, D stands for division, A stands for addition, and S is subtraction. So basically, I'm gonna write this out and you're gonna remember this. What do you do first? Well, you could work this problem left to right. 15 plus two is 17, minus one is 16. Now what's this? You might say, oh, it's one plus three, that's four times four, it's 16, but that's not right, because you're supposed to do this first. So it's 12, because it's multiplication. Now you work left to right. 2 minus 1, that's 1, plus 12 equals 13. Okay? And also, remember parentheses. Remember these. If there's something within parentheses, you always do that first. Okay. So let's do one more problem. 36 divided by 4 plus 5. Well, let's do this first. 9, 36 divided by 9 and that's 4. Okay, so let's move on. Okay, let's learn some properties. Basically, always remember that a number over another number, that's, I mean, over the same number, simplifies to 1. Just remember that. Because 5 parts of 5 is just 1. Now, also remember that if you multiply something, let's say 2 thirds, If you multiply one side by one, or a form of one, or a clever form of one, then it's still going to be the same 
because if you reduce this fraction, you'll be back to where you started. So that equals 1. And when you multiply something by 1, you just get the same number. Anything times 1 is just that number. So now let's talk about simplifying. How do you simplify this fraction? Well, you can say that 5 fits into both of them, both of the numerator and the denominator. So you could say 2 times 5, you're splitting it up into the components, and 5 times 3. Now you cross out the 5s, and you're left with 2 thirds. You probably remember this from pre-algebra. But if you've never taken a pre-algebra course, that's okay. Let's do another example then. 18 over 9. Well, let's break 18 up. 3 times 3 times 2. And 9, 3 times 3. Cross out the 3s, and you're left with 2. You also can see this as 18 divided by 9. Well, that's just 2. Okay, so I think you've got the hang of that. Now, we're going to do it with variables. Remember those symbols that we talked about earlier? If we have xy over 3y, you can just cross out the variables, because this is what that actually means. And there's one on the top, one on the bottom, so when you're multiplying here, you can just cross it out. However, this does not work when you're adding. You can't just cross those out. That's not how it works. That is the simplest form of this fraction. Okay. So what's next are exponents. We talked about this a little bit before, but let's do it again. What is 2 squared? Well, that just means 2 times 2, and that equals 4. Now, what is... 4 squared, that just means 4 times 4, and that equals 16. What is 3 to the third power, or 3 cubed? Well, that's 3 times 3 times 3. And 3 times 3 is 9, and 9 times 3 is 27. You should memorize that, by the way. So, this is called the exponent, this number right here. And you can also do it with variables. n raised to the fourth power is equal to n times n times n times n. So now let's do some examples. Let's evaluate this expression. x to the third plus 2 when x equals 3. Well, what you have to do is you have to plug in 3 for that. So it's 3 quantity cubed plus 2. And 3 cubed is 27, as we learned earlier. 3 times 3 times 3. 9 times 3 is 27. 27 plus 2 equals 29. Now, we're going to learn about the distributive property. Now, the distributive property is something that you're going to use over and over again in algebra. Now, let's do it. So, what is 3 times parentheses x plus 2 close parentheses. Well, the way the distributive property works is that this is equal to 3x plus 3 times 2. And what I did here was I multiplied 3 times x, and then I added that to 3 times 2. And when you evaluate this, it's 3x plus 6. There's something that's called factoring. And factoring means taking something that's really complicated, or not that complicated, but something like this, like we just did, 3x plus 6, and then putting it back into this form with parentheses. So that would go back to 3x plus 2. Think about factoring as a distributive property in reverse. So let's try this with a different problem, 5x plus 10. How do we do that in reverse? Don't try to think backwards, just try to work through it. What common factors does each term have? Well, it's a 5. So we have a 5 on the outside. And then what do we multiply the 5 by to get 5x? x, of course. And then what do we multiply the 5 by to get 10? 2. And if we check it, 5x plus 5 times 2 
is 5x plus 10. Now I'm going to have another example that you're going to work through on your own, and then I'll give you the answer. Now do this, 3x plus 12. How do you factor this? Well, what's the common factor? 3. So we have 3. What? You have to multiply 3 by to get 3x. x. And then we add that to what do you multiply 3 by to get 12? 4. It's 3, parentheses, x plus 4. And that's how the distributive property works. Now, we're going to talk about writing expressions and how to represent basically what you say in English with numbers and symbols and everything. So this is how you write five more than, one, than a number, n plus five. This is some arbitrary number, and it's five more, so n plus five. That's five more than a number. Now how do you say three less than a number? n minus three. That's three less than a number. How do you say three times a number? Well, 3n, because you're multiplying it by n. And you also can write 3 times n as 3n, if you didn't know that. Now, how do you write a number divided by 5? Well, you have your variable, and you divide it by 5. That also means this. It's the same expression. It's just represented as a fraction. So, that's how you write what you say in English in math terms. So, let's continue. How do you solve equations? This is very important because you'll use this throughout your math career. So let's do an example. x plus 15 equals 12. And what we want to find is what is x equal to? So the way you find this is you want to get x alone on one side. And if you don't know about negative numbers, then I guess you're going to learn now. We have a number line here. This is a way to represent numbers. And we have 0 in the middle. And you're like, why is it in the middle? Well, the thing is, everything starts at 0. And then you can go in the right to infinity. Or you can go to the left to negative infinity. And basically, a way number line works is that the farther you go to the right, you go in the positive direction, 1, 2, 3. But you also could go to the left in the negative direction. And it's sort of like a mirror negative 1, negative 2, negative 3. This number is greater than this number because it's farther to the right than this number. So think of it as a mirror, and think of it as the closer you are to 0 when you're on the left side, the greater the number is. Or basically, the farther to the right something is, the greater it is. So anyway, let's just forget about that for now. We'll use that in this example. So x plus 15 equals 12. So we want to get x alone on this side. So what do we do? Well, we subtract both sides by 15, and you'll see that work out. So we have x equals, what's 15 minus 12? Well, it's 3, but it's 12 minus 15. So we have a number line here, and we have 12 here. We have 0, and we have 12 here. And we subtract 15. We're going to go past zero because this is 12 units right here and we're going to go past and then we're going to go three negative three units here and then we're going to end up at negative three because 12 plus 3 is 15 so 12 minus 15 gives us negative three because we're going all the way past zero to the negative region here and it's negative three so x equals negative three and if we test that out if we check our work negative 3 plus 15 equals 12. And that's sort of like writing 15 minus 3 equals 12. And you see it works out. So let's do another example so this doesn't confuse you. What is 5 okay, plus x equals 18? How do you solve this? This is a much easier example. Well, you subtract by 5 because you want to get x alone. Subtract by 5, and then we have x equals 13. And 5 plus 13, we're checking our work here, equals 18. So there we go. It works out. Everything checks out. Everything's great. So let's move on to the next lesson. 
we're gonna use formulas. Now, this is basically the foundation of algebra and the sciences, like everything uses formulas. And how to use formulas? Well, basically, we're gonna think of things as functions. Now, this is very useful to know because usually classes don't cover this until algebra two, but I'm just gonna cover it now. So a function is a great way to think about formulas or just using algebra in general. So basically for a function, we have an input and we have an output. What we put in is our x. So we're substituting some number for x. So we have our input. I'm gonna say our input is gonna be one. So that means x is gonna equal one. So for this function, I'm gonna put in one. So f of one equals five times one. I'm replacing, every time you see x, I'm replacing it with one here. Five times one plus seven, and that's just five plus seven, and that's 12. So our output is 12. Now let's try a different x value. x equals two. So we're gonna say f of two equals five times two plus seven, because I'm putting in this two every time you see the x. So that gives you 10 plus seven, and that equals 17. So basically, this applies to formulas because you're just plugging in stuff and you're getting something out, input and output. So basically, here's an example of a formula, and we're gonna use this so much later on. It's basically the foundation of how things move. It's distance equals rate times time. If you ever heard something say miles per hour, they're actually referring to miles over hour, and you'll see why that is in a second. So I'm saying distance equals the rate at which something travels multiplied by the time it takes for it to travel that distance. So basically, if you wanna say, let's say 50 meters, someone travels 50 meters, and they travel that at two meters per second, that's the rate at which they travel. How long does it take someone who's traveling at two meters per second to travel at 50, to travel 50 meters? So basically you wanna get T alone on this side. And with multiplying, you just have to do the inverse. So you divide both sides by two. So you cross out that two and you divide 50 by two, that gives you 25. 25 equals T or T equals 25 seconds. So if you were a little confused about that, let's do another example because this can be confusing since we didn't really cover multiplication with solving equations yet. 5t plus 8 equals 38. So how do you solve for t? Well, you can subtract 8 first, and then we have 5t equals 30. Then we're going to divide both sides by 5, so we can get t alone. We cross out the 5. 30 divided by 5 is 6, so 6 seconds. And that's how you solve it. So let's continue. Now we're going to learn something from geometry, because this is an algebra slash a geometry course, even though I won't be sort of teaching a lot of geometry. So this is a triangle. And you've seen this before, and maybe you did this in pre-algebra. But basically, a triangle has a base and a height. And to find the area of the triangle, it's one half multiplied by base times height. So if I say, find me the area, the base is three feet and the height is four feet. How do you find the area? Well, you know, this is the base and this is the height. So three times four times one half equals the area. So 12 times one half equals six. So the area equals six 
units squared. Okay, so we already talked about negative and positive numbers. So let's talk about greater than, less than, equal to, greater than or equal to, and less than or equal to. So basically, you can say, you can compare different numbers this way. So 14 blank 7. So is 14 greater than, less than, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, or equal to 7? Well, 14 is actually greater than 7. So you put the one that's greater on the side, the open side, and the one that's smaller on the lower side. So that's not a greater than or equal to, that's just a blank. So I'm going to make that a box instead so it doesn't confuse you. Okay. Let's do another example. 5 blank 6. It's actually 5 is less than 6 because it's closer to the 0 on a number line. And it's farther to the left than the 6 is. And that's how you want to think about numbers just all the time. Because on a number line, the farther right you are, the greater you are. The farther left you are, the less you are. So just remember that. Now let's do a negative number. Negative 15 blank negative 5. Is negative 15 less than negative 5 or is it greater than negative 5? You might say, oh, 15 that's greater than 5, so it's greater than, but that's not true because Remember, the number line is a mirror. And when I say that, I mean that it starts at 1 on the right and it starts at 1 on the left. So negative 15 will be farther this way than negative 5. If that's confusing, just look at a number line. And you could look one up online if you want, but you'll see that negative 15 is farther to the left. And anything that's farther to the left is less than a number. So it's less than negative 5. Okay, so that's all you need to know about that for now. Okay, so rational numbers. What are rational numbers? Well, rational numbers are any numbers that can be expressed as a ratio of two integers. So this is some arbitrary a over b. That's a rational number. And b can't equal 0 because obviously, let's give you an example here, um, 5 over 0. That also means 5 divided by 0. You can't divide something 0 times. That just doesn't make any sense. So that just doesn't work out. So that's a rational number. So just remember that. You don't have to do anything with it. Just remember that it's a rational number. So let's move on. So how do you add and subtract rational numbers? Well, it's pretty easy because you cover that in pre-algebra. All you have to do is get the same denominator and you're good to go. 8 fifths plus 4 thirds equals, well, you just have to get the same denominator, so let's multiply it by clever form of 1. You've already done this in pre-algebra. So that gives you 24 over 15 plus 20 over 15, and that gives you 44 over 15. So if you're confused on how to do that, well, that's okay because we're going to do more examples. Okay, so remember this. Of course, parentheses always means multiply. And a negative times a negative is always a positive. So remember that. A negative times a negative equals a positive. A negative times a negative equals a positive. Always. So what's negative 5 times negative 4? A negative times a negative is a positive, so it's positive 20. So now you know. We can move on. It also applies for division. A negative divided by a negative equals a positive. A negative divided by a negative equals a positive. A negative divided by a negative equals a positive. So, you remember our distributive property? Well, that also applies with negative numbers as well. 
So a negative 9 times a 5 plus x, what does that equal? Well, it equals negative 45 minus 9x, because we distributed the 9 with the 5, and then we added that to negative 9x, which is just minus 9x. So let's do another example. 8 times y minus 7. What does that equal? Well, you take this, you get 8y plus negative 56, and that just gives you 8y minus 56. So let's continue. So what we have next is writing equations. Now this is how you apply algebra to the real world. So I'm going to read this. Jose's salary this year was $23,400. This is $1,700 more than he made last year. What was his salary last year? Well, it's $1,700 more. So last year's quantity is x. And then it's $1,700 more. So we have x plus 1,700 equals 23,400. Now, we're going to subtract both sides by 1,700, and that's going to give us, get out your calculator, that is going to give us 23,400 minus 1,700, 21,000. $700. And that is correct. So let's move on. That's how you represent equations in the real world. So we're going to skip this chapter on proofs because you can learn proofs in geometry and I'll talk about them later. You'll also learn them in college, if you take any math in college. So, we already talked about equations, but we're going to review them one more time. x plus 7 equals 2. What is x equal to? I'll give you a second to figure this out. Well, you want to get x alone. Minus 7 minus 7, x equals negative 5. Okay, we're going to do a more complex example. How do we solve this? 2 thirds x plus 1 half x equals 5 6 plus 2 x. Solve it. Well, you want to get all the x's, the common terms on one side. So we're going to have 2 thirds x plus 1 half x. We're going to subtract 2 x on both sides. Minus 2 x equals 5 6. So let's add these up. 2 thirds plus 1 half. What does that equal? Just forget about the x's right now. Just solve this. Well, you want to get the same denominator, so it's going to be 3, I mean, 2 over 2, a clever form of 1, and 3 over 3, so we're going to have 4, 6, plus 3, 6, that gives us 7, 6, and that's the answer. So 7, 6, x, minus 2, x, equals 5 over 6. Now, how do you solve this? Well, 7, 6, x minus 12 over 6, x, because 12 over 6 is 2, equals 5, 6. Now, subtract that. That's negative 5, 6, x equals 5, 6. You now multiply by the inverse, so you can cancel those out, and you just get 1 and do it on both sides. And you're left with x equals negative 1. And you could try that out and check your answer. Negative 2 thirds minus 1 half equals 5 6 minus 2. And let's try that out. Negative 2 thirds times 2 over 2 minus 1 half times 3 over 3, that gives us 
negative 4, 6, minus 3, 6, negative 7, 6, equals 5, 6, minus 12, 6, and let's move down here, negative 7, 6, equals negative 7, 6, and it works out. So that is a more challenging example that you'll have to know how to do. So just watch that part of the video again if you don't completely understand. Absolute value. What is absolute value? Well, absolute value just means the distance a number is away from zero. So if we have one, the absolute value of one is just one. And we represent absolute value by these bars here. So absolute value of two is just two. What's the absolute value of negative three? I'll give you a second to think about that. It's just three. So x plus three is greater than four. How do you solve this? Well, you just gotta start solving it like a normal equation. So minus three, minus three, um, x is greater than one, because you have x on one alone, and it's x is greater than one. How do you graph that? Well, you have a graph here, right? You're zero in the middle. And then you got one tick mark here, you got a one. X is greater than one, so you make an open circle and you go to the right because it's greater than one. Okay? And it's an open circle because it's not equal to one, it's greater than one. So it's everything above one, basically. So 1.1, 1 .1, it's that. But it's not one itself. It can't be that. So it's an open circle. Um, now, something important you need to know is when you're sort of multiplying or dividing by a negative number, when you're solving these equations, you have to flip the inequality. And what do I mean by that? Well, here's an example. Negative 5x is greater than 40. So how do I do this? Well, you gotta divide by negative 5. So we have x is less than negative 8. And we flipped this because we divided by negative number. So just remember that. And if you graph this, I'll give you a minute to do it. So how would you do this? Well, you have a negative 8 here. It's on the left side because it's negative. And it's less than that, so it's an open circle and it goes to the left. Okay, so we talked about exponents before and how 3 to the third is 3 times 3 times 3, and that equals 27. And how variables can also be represented and that's just a times b times b over b times a, cross out, cross out, cross out, cross out, that just equals b. So we talked about how variables and numbers can be represented with exponents. Now we're gonna talk about some rules with exponents. So we're gonna talk about adding exponents, multiplying exponents, the whole deal. So when you have these numbers and they're multiplying together, what do you get? Well, you just add these, so you get 3 to the ninth. Because you're multiplying this, you just take it and it's 3 to the ninth. So a way to represent with variables would be that, and then you would say it's a to the ninth. And here I could prove this, um, not formally, but I'll just show you. So 3 to the third plus 3 to the sixth. Um, let's just evaluate, I mean, times 3 to 6. Let's evaluate that separately. So 3 raised to the 3rd, uh, that's 27. And 3 raised to the 6, that's 729. That's 729 times 27. That's 19,683. Now, what's 3 to the 9th? It's the same thing. So that's just how it works. If you always forget then you could always just test it with some small numbers and you'll remember. So now, sort of same thing with division except uh, the inverse kind of operation. Three to the fourth divided by three squared. Instead of adding like you did with multiplying, you actually subtract. So what's four minus two? Well, it's two, so it's just three squared. Let's do an, another example. A to 6 over A. 6 minus 1, because that's actually A to the 1. It's the same thing. 6 minus 1 is A to the 5th. Okay, so that's how you do that. Now we're going to talk about parentheses. 
So I'm going to write out the arbitrary rule here. A to the m, parentheses, to the n, is actually a to the m times n. That's kind of weird, but it works. So 2 squared, parentheses, 4, that actually equals 2 to the eighth. So just remember that, and you'll be good. So moving on, what's after that is something that's really critical for later that you'll need for factoring and for really cool stuff that you'll need in algebra. And that's multiplying and dividing monomials. So what's a monomial? Well, this is a monomial. It's like one term, but it involves, well, variables. This isn't also a monomial. This is a monomial. So those are all monomials. That's so you get a general idea of what they are. So let's multiply them. 3x times 4x. What does that equal? Well, 3 times 4 is 12, and x times x is x squared. So it's 12x squared. So let's do another one. 3x squared times negative x. What does that equal to? Well, 3 times negative 1 is negative 3, and x squared times x is x cubed. So that's the answer. Let's, let's do one that's a bit harder. Negative 3a times 4a squared times negative a to the fourth power. How do you solve that? Well, you just go left to right. So negative 3 times 4 is negative 12. a times a squared is a cubed. And now, now let's do that times this, since we got these out of the way. So negative 12 times negative 1 is 12. And a to the third times a to the fourth, remember, add this, so it's a to the seventh. And that's the right answer. So now that you got the hang of that, let's move on to something that's pretty cool. It's called scientific notation. And this is how scientists write really big or really, really small numbers. So um, let's think of a scientific example, 6.28 times 10 to the 23rd. So I'm just using a dot. You can use an x. But this is how you solve this. So if you remember from pre-algebra, scientific notation means that you take this number, 10 to the 23rd, and you say, I want to go 23 to the right here because it's a positive number. So you go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. And that's how many zeros are there, the ones that fit in these slots. So I'm just going to keep making zeros. No big deal. Just more and more zeros. And you can see why they're using this notation, because no one wants to write this many zeros. And that's how big the number is. It's a whole lot. So how do you represent 1 million? So it would actually be 1, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. So it would be 1.0 times 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 times 10 to the 6. That's how many times we went to the right. Now if we're going to the left, it's going to be 1.0 times 10 to the negative 6. And that would give us a very different number. 1.0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And we have 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0. So that's scientific notation, and you can use it for a lot of different things in science. So let's continue on. So polynomials, polynomials are like monomials, but more. So this is a monomial, as we covered before, and this is a polynomial. This is also a polynomial. And this is even a polynomial, this crazy number. These are all polynomials. It's just a monomial or a sum of monomials. So that's what a polynomial is. Remember that, and you'll be good. So how do we add polynomials? Well, if we have the same kind of variable, just continuing on, you just add like terms. And what does that mean? 
Well, I'll show you. 3x squared plus 2x squared plus x plus 1 equals. So, how do we solve this? Well, we find like terms. And what does that mean? Well, it's the same degree of the polynomial. So, x squared, x squared, that means you add these two. Is there another x? No. Is there another, um, another uh, number without a variable next to it? No. So, it's just this. 5x squared plus x plus 1. That's the answer. Pretty easy stuff. And you can remember this. But let's do another example. Negative 5x squared plus 18x squared plus x plus 4x plus 5 plus 6. What does that equal? I just made this one up. So, well, like terms, there, 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 and there, and there, and there. So let's add it. Well, 18 minus 5, that's 13x squared. And then x plus 4x, that's 5x. And then 5 plus 6, that's 11. And there you go. That's the answer. So I hope that's right, because I just made that up. And let's continue on to multiplication. So we, I know we already did this, but it also works with this review property. Let's try this. 2x, parentheses, 5x plus 3. How do you do this? Well, distribute, distribute, and it's 10x squared plus 6x. And if you want me to walk you through that, 2 times 5 is 10, x times x is x squared, so there you go, plus 2 times 3 is 6, and then x times 3, I mean x, that's just appended to that, so it's 6x. So there you go. Okay, now I'm going to teach you the hardest and weirdest chapter of algebra, and that is factoring and FOIL. So what is FOIL? Well, FOIL is this. First, outer, inner, and last. And what is what the hell does that mean? Well, I'll show you what it means. So let's say we have two binomials here. And we're going to FOIL this, because that's, that's how you multiply these kinds of numbers. So let's FOIL it. First, that means the first term times that. So what's that? 30x squared, because 5 times 6 is 30, x times x is x squared. Okay, now let's do outer. That means these two terms. These are the outer terms. 5x times 2, that's 10x. Inner, 1 times 6x plus 6x. And last, these are the last terms, the ones on the end, plus 2. And let's uh, simplify this add those like terms, and there we have it. That's our answer. So that's foiling something. Let's do another example. Um, 2x plus 1, 3x plus 4. So let's foil this. First, outer, inner, last. And you could just draw a diagram like that if you need help. So it's 2 times 3, that's 6x squared. First, outer plus 8x plus the inner 3x last plus 4. So 6x squared plus 11x plus 4, and that's the answer. So factoring, what factoring is, is just FOIL in reverse. And you're like, oh, so I go last, inner, outer, first? No, that's not how it works. Factoring is kind of a little more complicated, and it was my worst part of algebra when I was taking algebra. So I'm going to explain it, and it's really weird, but I guess you'll get the hang of it. So if we FOIL this out, we get x squared plus 2x minus x minus 2, x squared plus x minus 2. And you say, oh, I want to factor this. So how do you go about factoring it? You want to go from this to this. Now how do you visualize that? Well, a good trick that I have is, well, what multiplies to this but adds to this? And you'll see why that works. So let's think about it. Negative 1 and 2. Does negative 1 and 2 add to 1? Yes. So x minus 2 x plus 2, I mean, 
x minus 1. Yeah, because negative 1 and 2, those, when multiplied, you get negative 2, but they add to 1 because 2 minus 1 is 1. So that's the factorization. And as you can see, that's exactly what this is, except kind of backwards, but it's the same thing. So that's basically how you factor. How, what, what multiplies to this and what adds to this coefficient here? So let's try another example. 3x plus 1 to x plus 3. So actually, that's fairly complicated. Let's try that. So 3x squared plus 9x plus x plus 3. When I FOIL it together, you get that plus 10x plus 3. So how do you factor 3x squared plus 10x plus 3? Well, you can say you have to look at this term and this term. And it's fairly complicated, but you just got to think about it carefully. Now, since 3 is a prime number, we're just going to write 3x here. And we're going to multiply 3x times 1, so we have an x here. So we know that much. And we want to get 3. So we're going to add by 1 here because it's 3 times 1. Because when we multiply our outer terms, we get 3. And then we're going to do that. So does that come out right? No, it doesn't. Because when we multiply it out, we get 3x squared plus 3x plus 3x plus 3. And that doesn't equal 10x. So what it really takes is a bunch of trial and error. You know you need 3, you know you need 1, and you know you need that 3 at the beginning. So let's try 1 and x plus 3. And when you try that, you get 3x squared plus 9x plus x plus 3, and that's the answer. So these factoring problems really just take a lot of practice, and you can never really get it the first time when it's something hard like that, unless you really get the hang of it. So let's try another example that's maybe a little bit simpler. Okay. So x squared plus 8x plus 16. How do you get multiply to 16, add to 8? Well, 4. 4 times 4 is 16, and 4 plus 4 is 8. That's how I like to think about it here. 16, and then we got 8 here. So that's what you do for those easy kind of factoring problems. x plus 4 and x plus 4. And when we FOIL this out, remember first, outer, inner, last. First, outer, inner, last. We have x squared plus 4x plus 4x plus 16. So we have x squared plus 8x plus 16, and that is what we have. So that's foiling and factoring for you. Now we're going to look at some more special cases like that one with the three term that we did. And it's called a difference of two squares. Now I'll show you an example of a difference of two squares. x squared minus 9. And why is it a difference of two squares? Well, basically you can write that as this. And these are two squares and it's a difference between them because you're subtracting. And that's what it looks like when you factor it. And that's just something you should know, but let's try this. First, outer, inner, last. So x squared minus 3x plus 3x, that's just 0, and then minus 9. So we have x squared minus 9. I'll show you another difference of two squares. x squared minus 4. Now you remember that's 2 times 2 equals 4, um, 2 squared equals 4, so it's x plus 2, x minus 2. That's a difference of two squares. So just look up factoring problems, and I'm sure you'll get the hang of it eventually. So now we have one more thing that we're going to cover here, and that's basically more foiling, more distributive property stuff. And it's a little complicated, but you'll definitely get the hang of it. And it's this. So 2x plus x plus 1 times x plus 3. Now how do you do this? 
Well, first of all, I like to write the one that's less on the left side, so it's a lot easier to do. Um, you could either do this, where you multiply that, plus that, plus that, plus that, plus that, plus that. But that would take a lot of time, so a better way to do this would just be x plus 3 times 3x, because you added that and that. x is just 1x, so 3x plus 1. And then you FOIL it, first, outer, inner, last. But when it's something you can't just simplify it like that, say it's x plus 4 times 3x squared plus x plus 4, then you actually have to multiply it out. So let's do this just quickly. I won't explain what I'm doing, I'll just do it. And then you want to combine like terms. And there you have it, that's the answer. So that's how you do that. There are more complicated factoring techniques, but all you really need is some trial and error and practice with factoring. Because honestly, I don't use some of those complex techniques, and I don't think that you will need to use them either, because this is just a crash course. Now we're going to do one more technique, however, and it's called factoring by grouping. And you kind of need this. So let's pay attention. So this is how you factor by grouping. 6x cubed minus 9x squared. This is our example, plus 4x minus 6. So how do we factor this? Well, all we got to do is separate this into two groups. So, and then we're going to just factor out a 3 here and an x squared. So we got 3x squared times 2x minus 3 and then plus 2, 2x minus 3, and as you can see, it's the same thing, so all you gotta do is 3x squared plus 2 times 2x minus 3, and that's the answer, and you can check that if you want somehow. But all you need are just a bunch of practice problems, and you'll get the hang of factoring. I know that helped me when I was learning factoring. So. That's basically how you do it. Just look for those, look for what you can pull out of something. So if you have like 6x squared plus 9x, then you just say, oh, they share a 3 in common. They also share this x squared in common. So just pull out a 3x squared. We have 2, and then we have 3x. So that's how you do it. That's all you got to do for factoring. And just remember those rules, and you'll be fine. Do a lot of practice problems. Just look up online hard factoring problems, and you'll just learn them eventually. So now let's do the best chapter in all of algebra, graphs. Graphs are really fun because they allow you to represent things visually, and they're very applicable into real-world problems. So here we go. So if you've never seen this before, it's a graph and we have an x-axis and we have a y-axis. So basically, this is how you plot points. Now, I'm gonna get some graph paper, but before I do that, I'm just gonna show you this on my just normal paper. And this is how graphs work. So remember on our number line, we had our zero in the middle and then positive and then negative, right? It's the same thing for here. We have negative numbers, positive numbers, and for the y-axis, it's the same thing, except rotate it to the right, where zero's here, positive, negative. So up is positive, negative is down, right is positive, negative is left for the x obviously. So if you wanna plot some points, here I'm gonna get out my graph paper, and I'm gonna show you just exactly how you're gonna do that. So just get some any old graph paper, and what you want to do is make your axes, axes, okay, and yeah, put the arrows because they continue on forever. That's how it works. And basically, if you want to plot some points, if I want to plot this point, 1, 1, how do I do that? Well, this represents the x-coordinate, and that x represents the y-coordinate. This is the y and the x. So, basically, that means go 
one positive x and one positive y. So we're going to go one to the right and one up because that's how you do it. So that's one, one. Now I challenge you to graph this, six, eight. So I'll just tell you how to graph it first. Go six right and eight up. So how do you do that? You start from the origin. You go six right, one, two, three, four, five, six, and eight up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So that's six, eight. Now let's say you want to connect those two points and make a line or a line segment. So I'm going to connect them like that. And now you want to say, well, how steep is that line? Well, you can tell the steepness of a line like that by finding the slope. And to find the slope of a line, you take the y minus this y over x minus this x. So the equation is y minus y naught over 6 minus, I mean, sorry, x minus x naught. That's how you find slope. And slope is represented by m. And naught just means the other x. You know. So if I want to find the slope of this line, you want to say, Okay, so y, that's 8, minus the other y, 1, so 8 minus 1 is 7. Now, 6 minus 1, that's this x minus that x, that's 5. So the slope of the line is 7 fifths. And that is all cool. And let's find the slope of another line. So let's find a point, uh, 1, 4, 1, 1, 2, 3, 4. I went 1 to the right and 4 up. And let's say I want another point, 4, 1. 1, 2, 3, 4, 4 to the right, 1 up. And there you go. What's the slope of this line? Now, this is pretty cool, and you'll see what happens. So let's do this. 4 minus 1, 1 minus 4. 3 over negative 3. Well, that just evaluates to negative 1. And as you can see, that's the slope, negative 1, because it goes 1 down here. And a way to see this is basically, well, why is it y minus y naught? Well, you can say here, this is the difference in the y, difference in y, and here's the difference in x of the two points. So that's what slope basically is. So now I'm going to show you something even cooler. How do you find the equation of a line. How does that work out? How do you find the equation of a line? And you find that with this specific equation. y equals mx plus b, where m is a slope, and b is basically the distance that the points, the starting point, or where the y-intercept is above the x-axis. And I'll explain what that means in a second, because that's pretty confusing. So let's graph this. y equals 2x plus 4. Now, how do you do that? Well, all you got to do is plug in points. And I'm going to show you a quicker way, but right now I'm just going to show you how to plug in points first. So basically, this is going to be our input and that's going to be your output and if you remember from functions you can say this f of x equals 2x plus 4 but what we're sort of solving for is the y coordinate okay and we're putting in our x and we're getting out our y so this is our input and y is our output so let's find just let's plug in a bunch of points a bunch of x points so where is y when x is 0? Well, y equals 2 times 0 plus 4. y equals 4. So you go up 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. And let's find another point. Let's say x equals 2. So y equals, let's replace x with 2 plus 4. So y equals 4 plus 4. y equals 8. So we go 2, and then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. We go off the graph. Sorry about that. And that's where it is there. And if we want to make a line, all we need are two points, and we connect those points, and we have a line. So let's do another one. 
y equals 3x plus 2. Now I'm going to show you the quick way to graph this. I already showed you inputs and outputs, but here's a really quick way to graph a line. So since I have 2, that just means that the y-intercept is going to be at 0, 2, because x, when x is 0, that's just going to be 0, and it's y is going to be 2. Okay, so do you understand? Yes, you do. So just go up 2 from the origin. That's our first point. And now you see your slope is 3, so that means it's rise over run. That's difference in y over difference in x. So that just means 3 over 1, because that's our slope, 3 over 1 y over x. So you're going to want to go up 3 and to the right 1. So that's our slope. And then we can do that the other way because this point is up 3 and right 1 at that point. So all you got to do is connect those points and you have a line. Don't forget your arrows because it, continue it continues on forever. So that's how you graph lines. It's very, very cool. So that's all nice, but why is this relative to what I do in life? Well, here's a word problem that you probably won't actually come across, but it is still kind of interesting. So basically, I'm going to make one up right on the spot. So I'm going to make our graph here. And here it is. So basically, I'm going to make a t chart, x and y. So I'm going to change x to t because I want to represent it as time. And instead of the x-axis, it's going to be the t-axis. You can do that. And this is going to be the y-axis. So basically, at the beginning of the day, um, Pedro has a business, OK? And at the end of the day, at t equals zero, Pedro has $100 in his bank account. He's making money because he has a job. And at the end of the day, he has $300. What is the slope of this line? How can we represent how much money Pedro is making in a day? So that's pretty simple. All you got to do is make a graph. And I'm going to show you how to make a graph. So let's scale this. The minimum value here on this was 100. So how about let's divide this up into threes because we have to get to 300. So one, two, three. So one, two, three. That's going to be 300. That's going to be 100. And that's going to be 200. OK, and then that's over time. So we're going to divide this up. So we have zero hours. One, two, three, four, five, six. 9, 10, okay, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, okay, so let's just say that's 4 hours, 4, 8, 12, 16, 20, 24, so at 24 hours, he has 300, and at 0 hours, he has 100, so connect those two points, and that's how much money Pedro is going to be making. How do we represent this as a function, f of x, or just as this, y? Well, we know our y-intercept. It's 100. So we can say y equals something x plus 100. And what's the slope of this line? What's the m? Well, what's the difference in the y's? 300, 100. The difference is 200. So. That's 200. What's the difference in the x? Well, 0 to 24, that's 24. What's 200 divided by 24? Well, if you reduce that, that's 100 over 12. That's 50 over 6, 25 over 3. So we have y equals 25 over 3, x plus 100. And that's our equation. So if you want to understand that, um, just watch that part of the video again, and you'll know how to represent basically any kind of linear um, problem as a graph and also as a function. Okay, let's learn something. What are parallel lines? Well, parallel lines are just lines that have the same slope that never touch each other because they're the same slope. They're never going to intersect. 
what are perpendicular lines or orthogonal lines? Well, they're lines that intersect at a 90 degree angle. And if you don't remember degrees, that's okay. This means 90 degrees. Um, degrees are measured in 360. Um, that's a complete turn. So if it's like a fourth of a turn, what's 360 divided by four? That's 90. So that's why this is 90 degrees. So that's a perpendicular line. Um, perpendicular lines. So how do these differ with slope? Well, I already said that parallel lines have the same slope, but what about perpendicular lines? Well, the weird thing about perpendicular lines is that they have the sort of inverse reciprocal slope. So if one has, one line has a slope of one, so let's draw that here. has a slope of 1, it's going to look something like this. So y equals x. Well, the one that's perpendicular is going to have the inverse reciprocal. So the inverse reciprocal of 1 is just negative 1. Because you flip it, you flip that around, and then you add a negative. So it's going to look like this. And as you can see, that's 90 degrees, and they're perpendicular. A system of equations. So systems of equations are basically just two equations together. And here, I'll give you an example. A system of equations, they can look like this. y equals x plus 1, and 2x plus y equals 4. Now, you could solve system equations with three methods, substitution, elimination, and graphing. So substitution is my favorite method because it kind of just gives it to you. So y equals x plus 1. So that means you could substitute x plus 1 in for y. So every time you see y, I'm going to substitute this in. Boom. 2x plus x plus 1 equals 4. So let's just get rid of those. 2x plus x that's just 3x. 3x plus 1 equals 4. Solve for x. Subtract 1. 3x equals 3. Divide by 3. x equals 1. So now we have that. And you know that y equals x plus 1. And since x equals 1, we're going to substitute that in. And that gives us y equals 2. So basically the solution is 1, 2. Let's represent it as a point. x is 1 and y is 2. And we're done. So that's how you solve it with substitution. Pretty weird. It comes out actually quite elegantly, and it's probably the most beautiful thing you'll learn in Algebra 1. You can also solve uh, these systems by, well, graphing. If you graph it and you just see where they intersect, well, you'll get a solution because you'll see the point in which they intersect. And a cool way to do this, I'm not going to actually do it for you and like draw it out and everything, but I will show you something on the calculator. So I have um, a graphing calculator with me here. I'm going to show you how to use it. So basically, it's a TI-84 plus CE, and it's in color. So I'm just going to turn this on. And what we have here is our calculator. And to graph something, you go to the y equals, and you type in functions. So the first function I'll be doing here is this. So, basically, I'm going to graph this. So, negative 1 half x plus 7. And the second line I'm going to graph is this. y equals x minus 4. So, what's the solution to these? Line. So I'm going to graph them, and we're going to see. So right now I have a weird window, so I'm going to change that. I'm going to change that window to this. So you can see what's happening here. So hang in there. And there's the first line. And here's the second line. And we're going to see where they intersect at that point. That's the solution. So I'm going to do second calc intersect. And don't worry about what I'm doing, just watch what I'm doing. So 
I'm finding this point here, and there. It's intersecting at 7.3 repeating and 3.3 repeating. So that's the solution. Basically, where the lines intersect on a graph is the solution to the system of equations. So yeah, you're going to learn one more method, and it's called the elimination method. And this is probably the one that I use the least because it's not very useful in higher math. And honestly, you just don't even think about it. But let's do it. It'll be applicable to the SAT. So here we go. x plus y equals 5, and x minus y equals 1. How do we solve this? Well, just line them up, okay? Just line them up. That's why it's called the elimination method, because you're eliminating terms. Um, so... Oops. Sorry about that, folks. Minus y equals 1. So let's add these terms just like you would. So we have 6, y minus y, y plus negative y, same thing. So that's 0. So just don't put anything there. Then x, we have 2x. Then you want to solve for x here, x equals 3. And then you're going to say, oh, x plus y is 5, so that means y plus 3 equals 5. What does y equal? Well, y equals minus 3, minus 3, y equals 2. So the solution is 3, 2. And you're done. So that's the elimination method. Maybe look up some problems so you get good at those, but it's really not as important as the others. So... That's how you do it. Maybe look up some word problems for that. But other than that, you're pretty much set. So now we're going to cover something that I didn't really enjoy but when I first learned it, but then I really enjoyed it. It's called the distance equals rate times time equation. And even though it's one equation, it's applicable to a lot of different things in physics. So you'll come across that later. But right now, I'll just show you what it means. So distance equals rate times time. And we already talked about this, but rate is basically the speed at which something travels, and time is the time it takes for it to travel, and distance is the distance. So we can solve for one of these variables if we have the other two. So let's solve for distance first. So distance equals, so someone's traveling at 40 meters per second in a very fast car or airplane or something, and it takes them and they're doing that for about five seconds. How far did they go? How many meters did they go? Well, all you gotta do is 40 times five, that's just 800. No, it's 200. That's just 200. And that's 200 meters. So that's the solution. Um, now let's solve for rate. D equals RT, write the equation. So someone travels 80 meters, and they're traveling at some speed, and they, they're traveling for 30 seconds. So how fast were they traveling? If it takes them 30 seconds to travel 80 meters, well, you want to get R alone, so 80 divided by 30, R equals 80 over 30, um, R equals 8 thirds meters per second. Okay, let's solve for the last one, time. So someone travels 60 meters and they're traveling at 50 meters per second. How many seconds does it take them to travel that far? So divide by 50 and you get six fifths seconds. So that's the time. So that's how you use the D equals RT equation. So that's all nice. Let's move on to something a little more interesting for now. And we're going to skip set theory because it's not very interesting for now. And you've already done some of the inequalities. But we're going to do a little review of graphing and inequalities together, and it's going to be really fun. So I'm not going to actually write this out for you, 
I'm just going to show you on the graphing calculator again, but it's going to be interesting, and I'll explain what I'm doing as I do it, and you can look up some practice problems if you would like. Um, of course, I never mentioned this before, but the link's in the description, so I hope you saw that already. I'm using a textbook called Algebra 1, and it's the California edition, and it has everything that I'm talking about in this video. So, basically, I'm going to show you how to represent um, inequalities graphically in two dimensions. So, let's do a simple equation, x plus 1. And we're going to say that y is less than or equal to x plus 1. And how is that represented graphically? Well, we're going to search for less than or equal to. There it is. And we're going to see how that looks. And I'm going to explain why it looks that way. So basically, if you look close enough, that graph is actually dotted. And maybe you can't see that. Oh, wait. Never mind. It's not dotted because it's less than or equal to. It's not dotted. It's a solid line, and there's color here. So basically, it's the slope, and basically everything that's less than or equal to is here. And it's colored in, and it's down here because it's less than or equal to what that line is representing. Just like it was on a two-dimensional graph where it was a number line and basically you drew an arrow and it was pointing to greater than or less than. This is in two dimensions except it's down here. So let's do another one. And let's say x2, let's just do 2x. And y is greater than 2x. And this one, you will see a dotted line, so keep an eye out for that. So let's graph that. And I said, let's graph that. So as you can see, it's a dotted line. And it's greater than that line, so it's on the top. That's where the shaded part is. So that's basically all nice, but how do you find the solution of basically two of those kinds of equations? And I'm going to show you that, and I'm actually going to write that out, I changed my mind. Let's do something simple though. y equals x, and y equals 2x. And basically, what's the solution of these, rather, that? So what's the solution? And if they don't intersect at all, that means there's no solution. But let's see if there is. So we draw our axes here, and we have our x here, y equals x. And it's greater than, it's less than that, so we're going to shade that here. It's a poor shading, but you get the idea. And then y is greater than 2x. So that means we're going up here there and everywhere okay and there it's greater than that so basically everything here so where do they intersect well they actually intersect in this little section here it's a bigger section because it goes on for infinity but inside this graph here that is a solution so there's no like numerical kind of representation but there's a graphical representation there is when you learn higher math but in Algebra 1, this is how you represent the solution in this shaded region. So now we're going to talk about simplifying, adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing rational expressions. Now in Algebra 2, you'll learn how to graph these, but now you'll just learn how to sort of simplify them. So how do you simplify them? Well, remember factoring? Well, you can actually factor sometimes when you have a rational expression here. So how do you factor this? Well, remember, multiplies to this, adds to this, 5 and negative 2. So x plus 5, x minus 2. And that is a simplified form. There you go. And if you want to simplify it even further, well, it's not really going to be simplified because it'll be more complicated, but it will look like this.
and you'll just get the same thing again. So it's not really worth it. So that's that. That's how you simplify. Um, just remember factoring and remember what you can cross out, what you can't. But this is how you multiply rational expressions, and you'll talk about this more in Algebra 2. So I'll just give you a little quick primer here. It's like multiplying fractions here. Except you're doing it with like polynomials and stuff. So let's multiply this. So first let's simplify this. So x plus 3 times 5x plus 10 5 x plus 4 and let's multiply this out let's foil this first outer inner last 5x squared plus 10x plus 15x plus 30 so that's 5x squared plus 25x plus 30 over 5x plus 20 5x plus 20 and there you go so you can also simplify but I think I will let's pull out a 5x actually let's just pull out a yes a 5x and then x plus 5 plus 30 5x plus 20 you can actually simplify that here to a 5x plus 4 so we have an x squared plus 5x plus 30 over x plus 4 I'm just going to give you one example and you'll just have more practice along the way but here we go, 1 over x equals 1 over minus x. So what we can do is multiply both sides by this common denominator. And if we multiply both sides by the same thing, it doesn't matter because you can do that and it won't really change anything. So there, cross that out, cross that out, you get 4 minus x equals x. And 4 equals 2x divided by 2, x equals 2. And that's the end. So that's how you solve rational equations. You'll have enough practice and you'll probably pick it up well very soon. Okay, let's talk about real numbers and radicals. So radicals are basically anything that's under the square root sign. What's the square root of 25? Well, if you never learned this before, square root just means what times what equals this number inside that. So basically five times five is 25. So the square root of 25 is just 5. So basically square roots are pretty cool because let's say you have a square root of something, a uh, square root of 4. What is that? Well it's 2 because 2 times 2 is 4. Um, basically if you square a square root you just get that number. So just remember that if you square a square root you get the number because the square root of 4 is 2 and if you square 2 you get 4 so that's just a weird way to remember it but if you forget just try it out so that's those are square roots now here's something you can't have a negative inside a square root why is that well it's kind of complicated but basically it's not negative 2 that doesn't work because negative 2 times negative 2 is 4. It's positive 4. So basically when you're taking the square root of something it's actually plus or minus 2 because it could be negative 2 or it could be 2 that is being squared to get 4. So that's kind of complicated but that's all you just got to think about. So yes let's move on. Now just to prepare you for Algebra 2, I'm not going to show you how to solve the equations with radicals, but I will show you how to simplify radical expressions. So to get root 18, all you need to do is this means root 18, because if you multiply radicals, you can do that. You can just multiply them. You can't add them, though. 
um, because that doesn't equal that. No, it, it doesn't work like that. It's just root 9 plus root 2. So just remember that. And also, simplifying radical expressions, if you have root 18, well, you could split that up into root 9 times root 2. Root 9 is just plus or minus 3, so it's plus or minus 3 times root 2, and that's, that's all you can simplify. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about something called rationalizing the denominator, and that's a way of sort of simplifying these radicals. So, um, you don't want a radical in the denominator because that's kind of ugly. So, what you got to do is multiply by clariform run 1, and if you multiply it by the same denominator over the denominator, then you get this on the top, and 3 on the bottom, because root 3 times root 3 is just root 3 squared, and that just gives you 3. And then, that's what you get. Root 6 over 3. Sorry, just 3. So that's the answer. That's rationalizing the denominator. So, if we move on, that's basically all you really need to know about rational expression, uh, radical expressions. So, now we're going to learn something called the Pythagorean Theorem. The Pythagorean Theorem states, a squared plus b squared equals c squared in a right triangle. So a right triangle is just a triangle with a 90 degree angle here, and this is a, this is b, and that's c. So if I say, okay, using the Pythag Theorem, find c when a equals 3 and b equals 4. Well, you want to say, okay, so a squared plus b squared equals c squared. And this is basically what we did at the beginning of algebra. If a equals 3 and b equals 4, then what is c? So 9, because 3 squared, plus 4 squared, that's 16, equals c squared. And that's 25 equals c squared. Now, to find this, you just take the square root of each side. So then we have c, because we took a square root of c squared, that's just c, c equals 5. So c equals 5. Okay, so now this is the last chapter of algebra before we start sort of treading into algebra 2 territory where we're solving complex equations with quadratics and everything. So we're just going to talk about quadratics in general. Like, what does a quadratic graph look like? That's what we're going to look at right now. So. Basically what a quadratic is, a quadratic function, is f of x equals ax squared plus bx plus c. And basically, if you write out a quadratic function, it could look like something like this. So x squared plus 0 plus 0, or it could be just x squared, you know, that's what it is. And what does x squared look like? Well, if you do your input-output and everything, we have x and y. So when x is negative 2, y would be 4, x is negative 1, y would be 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 4. So basically if you graph this, it looks something like this. 0, so we go 1 and 1, negative 1, 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, negative 2, 1, 2, 3, 4. And then if you connect these points here, connect the dots, you get something that looks like a cup that continue on, continues on forever. And if you graph this on a graphing calculator, let me get on my graphing calculator here, focus. Uh, okay. And I'm going to change this to equals. And it's going to be x squared. And what is that going to look like? There you go. That's what it looks like. That's what a quadratic function looks like. And then it's, it's sort of like plotting, you know, your slope and everything. It's just a little different. Um, f of x equals x squared plus 2. You just translate it up to. So when the original one was started here, the new one's going to start up here. And it's going to look like that. So we'll talk about translations more in Algebra 2, but
but that's just basically what a quadratic function looks like. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you don't understand anything in this video, then feel free to pick up this textbook. It's Algebra 1, California edition. I use this to study algebra, and it was really helpful for me. Um, you can also look up online resources like Khan Academy, and that'll help you with things like solving equations and graphing or whatever you need help on. So I'll see you in geometry, and thanks for watching. Bye.